President Biden brings Armageddon. Basically, everywhere he goes, everything seems to break. Or as others have said, everything he touches turns to... Mm. And so today we're going to talk about a very troubling message that President Biden had for a bunch of his rich Democrat friends, stuff that they won't really talk to us about. He'll communicate about with his Democratic donors. The story comes over from the AP. Biden and his Armageddon talk edges beyond the bounds, what they say is of U.S. intel. And look at the photograph they used here of the Joe Biden president. Here he is. Even the AP is like, oh, this guy's a disaster. Here, pick up that image where it looks like he doesn't know anything. Use that one. That's what they went with, rightfully so. The AP tells us President Joe Biden's warning that the world is at risk of a nuclear Armageddon, which means the end of it all. Like we all die, it's all over. Coming from the president, they say, was designed to send an unvarnished message that no one should underestimate the extraordinary danger that the world is in. The president's grim assessment, they say, was delivered to a Democratic fundraiser, all of his rich friends. Yeah, make sure you go diversify your portfolios, you know, get out of these things or whatever. He makes that known to them, but it rippled out around the globe. And they say it appeared to edge beyond the boundaries of what the U.S. intelligence experts are saying. So, of course, the U.S., like most things, they came out and they just walk it all back. They, let's continue. U.S. security officials continue to say they have no evidence that Vladimir Putin has imminent plans for a nuclear strike. Biden says we're all going to die. The White House says no, we're not. Every time he misspeaks, they walk it back. Biden veered into talk about Ukraine at the end of his standard fundraising remarks, saying that, quote, Putin was not joking when he talks about the use of nuclear weapons or biological and chemical weapons. This is a point we've made here many times. We've watched Putin and we've seen his demeanor and his consistency over the years. We've considered this an existential threat here. It's been pretty obvious that if Putin loses legitimacy and credibility, it's going to be analogous to the fall of Russia, which would be the end of their entire world. And so when he says it's an existential crisis, I think it kind of makes sense to believe him. In this case, evidently, the president does. Joe says he's not joking when he talks about the use of tactical nuclear weapons or biological chemical weapons. He said, quote, we have not faced, we have, we have not faced the prospect of Armageddon since Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. He said that the threat from Putin is real because his military is, you might say, significantly underperforming. And if you're pushed into a corner, you may really have to act out. Now, the White House, of course, disagrees with the president and they have to correct him when he speaks. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre on Friday did not directly respond to a question about whether he'd gone off in the event or whether he intended to invoke Armageddon. But they were trying to clarify things. She told reporters, she said, Russia's talk of using nuclear weapons is irresponsible and there's no way to use them without unintended consequences. Adding, if the Cuban Missile Crisis has taught us anything, it's the value of reducing risk and not brandishing it. Officials saying, don't underestimate the use of nuclear weapons and this could turn into a gigantic problem. The president, ordinarily when he speaks, it's supposed to carry some weight, supposed to have some consequence. So people are listening to the president and they're saying, huh, if he's saying Armageddon is actually coming, are his actions matching his rhetoric? Is there anything that he's doing that might support that prospect? Turns out maybe there is. The Epoch Times is reporting that the United States government buys $290 million worth of drugs in preparation for nuclear emergencies. Oh, great. Hopefully they're not mandatory. The U.S. Department is now buying $290 million, part of its longstanding ongoing efforts to be better prepared for radiological and nuclear emergencies. This was announced from the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response back on October 4th. It is approved by the FDA to treat blood cell injuries, acute radiation syndrome. N-plate is the name of the drug. Stops radiation-induced bleeding and all of those things. Now, I was looking through here to see if, you know, where, where Pfizer and Moderna was, but uh, maybe they just, uh, you know, maybe it's a subsidiary or something. But yeah, a lot of big money now going into the prospect of nuclear war. Doesn't seem too good. 
Very interesting article from an individual named Policy Tensor talking about a nuclear zugzwang. And this is a new term for me. I had not learned about this, a chess term. And we'll learn a little bit more about it. But this article came from Policy Tensor over at Substack. And we're going to read a little bit. I'd encourage you to follow him and read the rest of the article on his Substack and support his work. But here's what he says. A nuclear zugzwang? How should the U.S. respond if the Russians go first? If they use the nukes first? Policy writes, We've entered a dramatically more fraught and a dangerous phase in the struggle over Ukraine. Putin's recent decision to have two parallel objectives is concerning. One, shore up Russia's position, but that's just a secondary goal. The broader goal is that he is not going to accept defeat in Ukraine. And there is a big signal. Says Putin is now mobilizing reserves. 300,000 troops and maybe more are now going to the front. He said that this signals that Putin is burning the bridges. This is a resolve signaling theory. Saying that there is nothing that is going to stop us from being victorious. Putin has issued very pointed nuclear threats using language that was published in their nuclear use policy. Now he tells us that whether or not these annexed territories are Russian territories is not the important question. At this point, it doesn't really matter. Right now, the important question is not even whether the Russian elites believe that preventing Ukraine is a vital interest. They say... The United States war aim now from the U.S. perspective is to see Russia weaken to such a degree that it can't do the types of things that it wants to do. In other words, the point here is that Russia has to be removed. Now, suppose that if the United States continues on on this trajectory and it's Russia loses everything at all costs, as we've talked about with Jake Sullivan and others, saying that the only wait for a settlement, a settled negotiated peace is if Putin pays the consequences, we pick up there. Suppose that Russian armies in Ukraine are at risk of collapse and Putin's options are now to introduce nuclear weapons into the conflict. It's either nukes or lose. In a desperate situation, Putin may find that escalation is actually more attractive. And what does that look like? Russian nuclear use at any scale whatsoever, any type of bomb at all, will completely transform the conflict. It's going to break a 76-year-old taboo, and it's going to cause an extremely dramatic situation throughout the world. It says, we should expect a worldwide panic, the sort we've never seen before, not even in October 1962, which was, quote, a mild crisis by comparison. Consider the least escalatory option that the Russians might use. The Russians might use a demonstration detonation, in quotes. Russian forces airburst, and they do this to avoid the nuclear fallout that comes from a ground detonation. A tactical nuclear weapon with a sub-kiloton yield, for example, no bigger than just a regular conventional weapon, over uninhabited territory somewhere in the southeastern Ukraine doesn't kill anybody, doesn't wreck any buildings. It's up in the air and it's a small nuclear bomb, but it is a nuclear bomb and it is in Ukrainian territory. And that is the demonstration. That type of activity would be consistent with Russia's quote, escalate to deescalate doctrine. But what happens then? Precisely because it would be such a dramatic break with precedent, even a demonstration detonation would radically change the course of the war. New Yorkers and Berliners, etc., are likely to flee the cities everywhere. Everywhere in Europe and America, supermarkets would likely empty within hours. Many local authorities may institute civil defense measures, even as federal governments everywhere urge calm. A widespread breakdown of law and order would be a real possibility, especially in America, where it would be attended by a partisan passions and finger pointing. Under such conditions, keeping the Western alliance together will become extraordinarily difficult. Indeed, it's possible that even NATO would break under pressure as anti-war and pro-Russian forces emerge from the repercussions and break the Western coalition. Policy says, In my judgment, the immediate battlefield effect would be to force freeze the military on the ground. 
The psychological impact of the detonation alone would force the Ukrainians to halt all military offenses immediately. And if the Ukrainians had such a great appetite that they wanted the military to continue, the U.S. would be forced to back down. For the diplomatic effect would be just as dramatic. The verbal response of the community of nations will be so loud that the global pressure would put on the warring parties to stop fighting. It would be insurmountable. They tell us what a zugzwang is. If this comes to pass, if the Russians use this, the United States will find itself with only bad options. In effect, Russia would have imposed a nuclear zugzwang on the United States. A zugzwang is a situation in which the obligation to make a move in one's turn is a decisive disadvantage. It's playing a game of chess and your opponent has to make a move and it's going to be a bad move. They have no choice. Russia goes first. Is the United States in a zugzwang? The U.S. nuclear response would be out of the question. U.S. can't use nukes. Given the reality of mutually assured destructions, can't nuke back. The United States could attempt to impose heavy costs on Russia with, I guess, even harsher sanctions. But he says even that's been largely exhausted. and We've done that in vain. And we could escalate the supply of the long range weapons and send all of that stuff over to Ukraine. But they're not nukes. The Russians have the nukes. Meanwhile, the pressure on the U.S. forces to force the Ukrainians to concede would be inconceivable. It would be considerable. And now this article goes on from Policy Tensor. Brilliant article. I'd encourage you to go follow that and learn more about a nuclear zugzwang over at Substack. Check out Policy Tensor over there. But a very concerning gamification of how this process may go. If the Russians strike first, the United States is sort of caught between a rock and a hard place with not a lot of options. So many people are concerned. Is America and the world facing an impending Armageddon? That's what Joe Biden said. But Joe Biden saying things doesn't matter a whole lot to most people because he can't talk anymore. Here is the president telling America about the three, I'm sorry, the two. This is President Joe Biden explaining to America the two and only two most important words of all time for our country. Let me start off with two words. Made in America. Made in America. That's, I'm pretty sure that's three words. Let's count them. Let me start off with two words. Made in America. Oh, made in America. Oh, it's th- it's th- it's three words. Oh man, I know I'm not too good with numbers here, but I I'm pretty sure I can count to three. Oh no, so the president is having a difficult time. So if Joe Biden says that an Armageddon is coming to take out America, maybe that's not true at all because he can't even know the difference between two and three. Let me start off with two words. Made in America. Made in America. Ma- maiden? Maiden America? Like Maiden Voyage? Maiden America Voyage? Maybe? Uh, not so sure. But the president is very uh, having a very difficult time with a lot of things. Not only is Joe Biden promising an impending Armageddon, but he's also now saying, yeah, gas prices are going back up too. I tried to help, but it's still Putin's fault. Putin's going to nuke us all. And he's responsible for your high gas prices, America. Cost is going to go up, not down. And I realize costs are going up on food. And I was able to bring gasoline down well over $1.60, but it's, it's inching up because of what the Russians and, and the Saudis just did. Putin's fault. I'm not finished with that yet. Saudi's fault too. And he's not finished with that yet. Our real tough guy president, Joe Biden, is going to go, I guess, have a conversation with the Saudis and gas prices are going to come down. Who knows? Very bizarre individual. Doesn't really know much of anything. Having a really difficult time out there. Uh, Made in America, two words, yeah. Yeah, and Joe Biden, when asked about this, didn't want to talk about it. 
The president runs away from the media when asked about his Armageddon comment. Many journalists are just like you and me. They don't want nuclear explosions to eviscerate their lives and their families. And so if the president, who's supposed to be somebody who's pretty plugged in and cognizant, the leader of the free world type of a thing, they might know something that maybe the journalists want to hear about. Mr. President, are we all going to die? Should I pick up my stuff and go in my bunker? Yes or no? Can you please answer some questions? Joe Biden doesn't want to talk. He wants to run away. Mr. President, will you talk to us about Putin, sir? Just running. I don't know why. What's he doing? Oh, you can't see it here. Why is he running away? Here he is again. Mr. President, will you talk to us about Putin, sir? He's just running. You think Armageddon is coming, sir? What's he doing? <laughs> I think he runs because he wants you to think that he's competent. He's like, oh, look, he can move sort of quickly for some reason. Yesterday, he's backing away from the media. He's like, no sudden movements. Don't don't scare the president. We're just slowly baking his way out. But then now he's just running all over the place. I don't know why he's running. He's running from the media. Maybe he knows, maybe Putin launched something. He's like, we better get out of here. Like that scene from Independence Day? I don't know. Are the aliens coming? That's the president, Joe Biden, running away. President Biden's not the only person who's running away all over the place. We have Jerry Nadler, the waddler, the man running around Congress with 30 to 45 pounds of excrement in his diaper as he stinks up the entire congressional buildings. He was cited. Fox News had some questions for him. They say, Jerry, you know, your policies are wrecking America. Can we talk to you about some of this stuff? He's going to be busy, yeah. Tomorrow? Does that work? Tomorrow? Who should we reach out to in your office, Congressman? I just want to talk about the crime crisis in America. We got a crisis in America. And so here's here's Nadler waddling over there. I want to talk about the crisis in America. We have a country with crime. There's the waddle. Yeah, you know, Lean says over there, he's you know, he's kind of cute. It's like it's like a little uh, like a little creature kind of a thing, uh, waddling around Congress, and that's who's in charge. That's who's been in charge for like 35 years or something. Uh, no answers to much. Doesn't want to talk to anybody. Just wants to waddle on away, out of sight, and back to the diaper changing facility, if there is one in Congress. Amazing. More people are running away. Katie Hobbs in the Arizona governor's race is running away from Hispanics. Doesn't want to talk to him. In this video, we have Carrie Lake who showed up for a town hall. She was there to meet the people and to talk about the issues. But Katie Hobbs, the Democrat governor candidate, ran away, just like many Democrats are running away in elections all over America. Carrie Hobbs and Carrie Lake were invited. Unfortunately, Katie Hobbs declined the invitation. Oh, loser. Carrie Lake, however, did accept the invitation. Carrie Lake accepted it. She comes right out. She'll have a conversation with you, no problem. Uh, nobody's standing there at Katie's podium. Oh. Oh, everybody's running away. All the Democrats with their terrible ideas. Nobody wants to talk about them. No debates. They all just want to slunk out and try the Biden strategy to see if that gets them elected. We'll see how it works out for them. 